expense recognition and uh, so what's the definition of an expense let's just read this expenses are decreases in economic benefit during the accounting period in the form of outflows or depletion of assets or incurrence of liabilities that result in decreases in equity other than those relating to distribution to equity participants so this is a mouthful but the concept is quite straightforward any decrease in economic benefit so whenever you are spending money that's a decrease in uh, economic benefit so that's considered an expense a depletion of assets so if you have an asset worth 1000 and you use it for a year and depreciate it down to 800 this 200 dollar depreciation is essentially a depletion of the asset so that's an expense so this is depreciation incurrence of liabilities that result in a decrease in equity so if a liability goes up which causes a decrease in equity that is also considered a uh, expense and keep in mind that if you are paying out dividends so that re reduces equity but paying out of dividends is not considered a uh, expense according to the matching principle expenses to generate revenue should be recognized in the same period as revenue so let's say that in 2010 you buy inventory worth a thousand dollars but that inventory is sold in 2011 so the revenue is generated in 2011 this means that the expense the inventory expense will be shown in 2011 and not in 2010 what you do in 2010 is show that cash goes out and create an asset called inventory so creation of an asset is different from recognizing an expense so in 2010 you create an asset called inventory and in 2011 which is when you generate revenue by selling that inventory that is where you recognize the expense so the expense would be called cost of goods sold period costs or period expenses these are expenditures that less directly match the timing of revenues and are reflected in the period when the company makes the expenditure or incurs the liability so for example electricity bills rent other utilities etc so these would be examples of period costs where you simply recognize the cost in the period where it is incurred so electricity bill for 2010 would all be recognized as electricity or as expense in 2010 you typically will not try to capitalize electricity expense as an asset in 2010 and then expense it out in uh, 2011 so even things like salaries etc are all generally considered period expenses or period costs delayed expense recognition results in higher income now so if a company is trying to delay expense recognition so even though it is spending cash but it tries to create an asset out of that uh, transaction and expense later that is one way companies can try to inflate income in the short run we will see this in a lot more detail in a later reading a few basic points right now i'm just going to read this out to plant some hooks in your head there is a full reading later on on inventory which we will which we will see later but there are different ways of recording inventory one method is called first in first out or fifo here the items first purchased are also first sold not from an actual perspective but from the perspective of costing so if you bought your first item for 10 dollars next for 11 and the third one for 12 when you sell the first item that you sell you say that the cost is 10 lifeo is last in first out so with the same example here here if you the first item that you sell you will say that the cost was 12 and a weighted average simply takes an average cost of all the items that you bought and for every item that you sell you take the cost as the average if you understood this great if you didn't then hold on for the time when we study this in more detail which will be in about a week or so
doubtful accounts at the time of sale it is not known which customers will default under the matching principle at the time of revenue recognition an estimate is made of how much revenue will be uncollectible such estimate is based on past experience with uncollectible accounts estimates expressed as overall amounts of sales or overall amounts of receivables the estimate is recorded as an expense in the income statement and not as a direct reduction in revenue so let's say that you sell goods worth 2 million of which 1 million worth is credit sales so these are recognized as revenue but you created an accounts receivable because you sold these on credit and based on past experience you know that let's say 10% of your credit sales with 10% of your credit sales the money is not going to be collected so if you know this and all these transactions happened in 2010 so you know that 10% of this 1 million which is 100000 is not going to be collected or is unlikely to be collected you create an expense called provision for doubtful accounts or this might be called provision for bad debts and this 10% of 1 million which is 100000 is shown as a expense actually the precise term is this is shown as a provisional expense in 2010 and this is consistent with the matching principle because if the revenue is recognized in 2010 this expense is needs to be associated with the 1 million revenue warranties represent another expense that you might see on the income statement at the time of sale the company does not know the amount of future expenses it will incur in connection with its warranties under the matching principle a company is required to estimate the amount of future expenses resulting from its warranties to recognize an estimated warranty expense in the period sale and to update the expense as indicated by experience over the life of warranty so what does all this mean let's say that your company sells goods worth 1 million dollars in 2010 now based on past experience you know that when you sell this much material the warranty related expense in the past for material that you sell in a given year is approximately 1% of your sales so now you are not sure whether or not 1% of this amount will come back as a warranty expense later on but if based on past experience your best estimate is 1% then in 20 in 2010 you need to recognize a a provision for warranties as an expense uh, it's essentially a provisional expense in the 2010 income statement so 1% of a million would be 10000 so you need to show a provision for warranty expense in the 2010 income statement equal to 10000 and later on if the warranty expense is more or less you make adjustments but in 2010 you show 10000 and this is this is essentially a um, illustration of the matching principle because this expense will be a result of sales made in 2010 and since the revenue is being recognized in 2010 the expense or the warranty expense that you anticipate as a result of these sales should also be shown in 2010 depreciation is another expense that you will see on the income statement and an important point about depreciation is that this is a non cash expense so let's look at how this works 
Essentially, with depreciation, we allocate the cost of a long-lived asset over the life of an asset. So, let's say that uh, when you buy the long-lived asset, you paid dollars hundred thousand for it, and let's say that the life of the asset is ten years. Using the straight-line depreciation method, essentially, you depreciate depreciate the same amount every year. If the salvage value at the end of 10 years is expected to be zero, then with the straight line method, you depreciate the same amount. So every year you will depreciate 10,000. And that means that the end of 10 years, the book value of this asset will be down to zero. With accelerated method of depreciation, you depreciate more in the earlier years and less in the later years. But the overall depreciation amount over the life of the asset obviously cannot exceed the initial value minus salvage value. So this just highlights what I've talked about. Straight line method evenly allocates the cost of long lived assets, less estimated residual value, which in my case was zero, over the estimated useful life of an asset, which in our example was 10 years. Accelerated depreciation allocates a greater proportion of the cost to the early years of an asset's useful life. Much more on this when we do the reading on long-lived assets later on. Amortization is almost exactly like depreciation. The only difference is that amortization is the allocation of the cost of an intangible asset over its useful life. Again, we will see this later, but examples of intangible assets might be things like uh, copyrights, patents, etc. And these are intangible, but a copyright might be purchased for say 10,000 and this might last 5 years. So the allocation of this 10,000 over 5 years would be referred to as a amortization expense. Some intangible assets have indefinite lives. A classic example is goodwill, where when you purchase a business and you pay more than the fair value, the additional amount that you pay is called goodwill. Now that goodwill does not have a definite life and hence it is an uh, intangible asset with an indefinite life. When you have such an asset, you need to test for impairment at least annually. And if you determine that an asset is impaired, that means that initially you determine that goodwill is worth 200,000. But when you test for impairment, you realize that goodwill now is only 150,000. So this asset is coming down by 50,000. How do you allocate that 50,000? Essentially, that 50,000 is a uh, expense which needs to show up in the income statement. So, if the asset is impaired, an expense equal to the impaired amount, 50,000 in my simple example, is recognized as an expense in the income statement. Discontinued operation. Income from discontinued operations are reported separately on the income statement after income from continuing operations. The reason for this is straightforward. As an analyst, when you are looking at the income statement, the first thing you want to see is how much is the income from the part of the business that is expected to continue in the future. So if you have XYZ company, that has decided to discontinue its food business. Let's say that the company has uh, four different product lines, A, B, C, and D, and product line D will be discontinued from next year. And that announcement has been made. So the businesses that will continue into the foreseeable future are A, B, and C. And as an analyst, you worry about or you are most concerned about what earnings you can expect from this company in the future. And because of this, it's important that the company reports its income from continuing operations uh, 
so first you will see the income reported from continuing operations which will be uh, reported in the regular way you will have your revenue your various uh, operating expenses and then you will have some non operating expenses and ultimately you will have your income from continuing operations and you expect that this this sort of income will continue in the future and then after that income from discontinued operations is reported separately net of tax so the ultimate net income is the sum of these two but the separate reporting is important for a uh, for analysis reasons extraordinary items under us gap an extraordinary item is one that is unusual in nature and infrequent in occurrence examples are losses from an expropriation of asset or more importantly and more frequently unusual losses from natural disasters extraordinary items are reported separately in the income statement net of tax after income from continuing operation now a lot of companies might potentially exploit this so in order to show high income from continuing operation they might be a little liberal in assigning expenses or allocating expenses as extraordinary in which case they can potentially overstate income from continuing operations and try to look better than they actually are so given this potential loophole or potential to overstate continuing operations IFRS completely prohibits classification of any income or expense item as being extraordinary. Unusual or infrequent items so this is according to US GAAP events which are unusual in nature or infrequent in occurrence but not both such as gains or gains or losses from sale of assets or part of a business impairments write off write downs restructuring costs all these unusual or infrequent items are included in income from continuing operations and are reported before tax so the the quick summary is if something uh, according to us gap if something is defined as extra or uh, so extraordinary this shows up after uh, after continuing operation so it would show up after continuing operations but if something is defined as unusual or infrequent so the or condition is there and examples shown over here then they need to be expressed or shown as part of continuing operations before tax operating and non operating components this is important so the operating expenses are expenses associated with the core operations of a business non operating expense would be expenses that are not part of the core operation so for a manufacturing firm interest expense would be a non operating expense so the way this shows up in the income statement you might have your revenue worth 1000 and then you will see certain operating expenses such as cost of goods sold salaries etc etc so that might be something like 700 and the company will then report something called operating income which is uh, the income from the core operations of the company this is a very important figure after that you will see non operating expenses and as mentioned earlier for non financial companies interest expense would be a classic example of a non operating expense so if interest is the only non operating expense here and let's say that's 100 you report your non operating expenses and after that you report uh, income before taxes which in this case is 200 and then you have taxes and net income changes in accounting numbers just need to know this briefly if there is a change in accounting principle so for example a company was using lifo uh, 
but now has decided to use FIFO for inventory valuation. If you don't understand this well, don't worry. You will get to know this much better when we do the reading on inventory. So if there is a change in accounting principle, the reporting needs to be retrospective. So retrospective application means that if you made the change in 2010, and what you then need to do is in the earlier years, you need to restate your your income statement and your financial uh, essentially your financial statements to reflect the fact that your accounting principle has changed and this has to do with the principle of comparability if you don't change the numbers for previous years then the comparability across years is compromised change in accounting estimate so for example you earlier had estimated that the useful life on your long-lived assets is 10 years and you now change that to eight years so this would result from a change in management's judgment and here we do prospective application so in this case we don't need to go and change the numbers for previous years prospective means that the change now applies to years in the future prior period adjustments Sometimes you might realize that there was a mistake in reports that had been published earlier. So basically this is a correction of a, uh, of a prior error and all you need to do then is restate, restate previous financial statements.